Hello. Thank you for returning to this series of reflections on the living gospel that is written in holy lives and in our own lives. In the previous reflection, I talked about Dorothy Day, whom I knew in the last years of her life. And in my next reflection, I'll be talking about Henry Nouwen, whom I knew very well for 20 years. Today, I'll be talking about Thomas Merton, whom I didn't meet in life. I was 12 when he died in December 1968. And yet he has been one of, the, one of the most important spiritual companions in my journey, as he is for many, not because of any miracles or mighty achievements, but precisely in his role as a spiritual explorer in the way we've been discussing. I began to read his books soon after he died, and so I always had this uh, thinking of, way of thinking of him as kind of a wise elder. Uh, it was startling for me to realize recently that I had exceeded his age by a dozen years. Let me begin. In 1968, as Thomas Merton embarked on his final journey to Asia, he wrote in his journal, May I not come back without having settled the great affair and found also the great compassion. I am going home, to the home where I have never been in this body. Merton had spent his early life on a grand tour that took him, as he summarized in the final paragraph of his memoir, The Seven-Story Mountain, Quote, from Prades to Bermuda to St. Antonin to Oakham to London to Cambridge to Rome to New York to Columbia to Corpus Christi to St. Bonaventure to the Cistercian Abbey of the poor men who labor in Gethsemane. To what purpose? He answered that implicit question in the words of God, that you may become the brother of God and learn to know the Christ of the burnt men. Though he remained at the Abbey of Gethsemane for the last 27 years of his life, that was certainly not the end of a journey, now more interior than geographical. He acknowledged as much in the Latin motto that concludes his autobiography, Sit finis libri non finis quarendi. Here ends the book, but not the searching. Truer words were never spoken. In fact, Merton's life continued to be marked by a restless search that continued until his death. In his struggle to plunge deeper into the mystery and depths of his own vocation, he traveled onward toward his true home, the home where he had never been in this body. I think that both Merton and Henry Nouwen, whom I'll also discuss, should be seen as spiritual explorers who came to a place of recognizing that there was no final destination in this life. Their home was the journey itself, a journey that would never be entirely completed in this body. In the end, Merton never returned from his final journey. But I think in his struggle to remain faithful and to trust in God's loving providence, he opened a path to holiness for all those who struggle amidst life's doubts, unresolved questions, and uncertainties. Merton first came to the world's attention in 1948 through the publication of The Seven-Story Mountain, the autobiography he wrote in his early years as a Trappist monk. It told a story that was by turns funny and sad of his search for his true identity and home, of his orphaned childhood, his education in France and England and New York, and of the pride and selfishness that brought nothing but unhappiness to himself and others. And he told of how his search had led him ultimately to the Catholic Church and finally, on the eve of World War II, to the Trappist Abbey of Gethsemane in Kentucky. On viewing the silent monks, Dressed in their white habits and kneeling in prayer in the chapel, Merton had exclaimed, This is the true center of America. In entering the monastery, Merton not only felt he was leaving the world and giving up everything, he was also leaving behind a certain Thomas Merton, with all his anxious desire to be somebody, his demanding ego, his tendency to sarcasm and scorn for people who didn't meet his standards. With the anonymous monks in their white habits, he'd intended to drown to the world, to be invisible, a nobody. Well, it didn't quite go that way. The Seven Story Mountain turned out to be an astonishing bestseller. It sold 600,000 copies in cloth in the first year. And Merton was suddenly the most famous monk in America. The irony was not lost on him. And yet his superiors felt his writing had something to offer the world, and they ordered him to keep at it, and so he did. There followed books of poetry, lives of Trappist saints, which he later deemed awful, books on monasticism, and an increasing stream of books on prayer and the spiritual life. If he ever doubted whether he was a true monk, 
there was never any doubt that he was truly a writer. Yet for all the books he would go on to produce, in the public mind he was eternally fixed at the point where his memoir ended, as a young monk with his cowl pulled over his head, happily convinced that in joining an austere medieval community he had fled the modern world never to return. It was difficult for readers to appreciate that this picture represented only the beginning of Merton's journey as a monk. One aspect of his book that he particularly came to regret was the attitude of pious scorn directed at the world and its unfortunate citizens. He had deemed the seemed to regard the monastery as a as a secluded haven set apart from the news and desires and appetites and conflicts that bedeviled ordinary humanity. In 1948, an errand into Louisville occasioned one of his first trips outside the monastery. In his journal, he noted piously, Going into Louisville the other day, I wasn't struck by anything in particular, although I felt completely alienated from everything in the world and all its activity. Though he felt the people were, quote, worthy of sympathizing with, overall he judged the excursion boring. What a difference a decade would make. Ten years later, in 1958, he records in his journals the radically different impact of another errand into Louisville. On the corner of Fourth and Walnut, in the center of the shopping district, which is an intersection that's recently been renamed Thomas Merton Plaza, he experienced a moment of mystical awareness that inspired one of the most famous passages in all his books. He writes, I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all those people, that they were mine and I theirs, that we could not be alien to one another, even though we were total strangers. It was like waking from a dream of separateness, of spurious self-isolation in a special world, the world of renunciation and supposed holiness. The whole illusion of a separate holy existence is a dream, not that I question the reality of my vocation or my monastic life, but the conception of separation from the world that we have in the monastery too easily presents itself as a complete illusion, the illusion that by making vows we become a different species of being, pseudo-angels, spiritual men, men of interior life, what have you. The passage ends with these marvelous words. There is no way of telling people that they are all walking around, shining like the sun. There are no strangers. The gate of heaven is everywhere. I want to underline those words. It was like waking from a dream of separateness, of spurious self-isolation in a special world, the world of renunciation and supposed holiness. In that dream of separateness, he's describing an understanding of holiness that had animated his early life as a monk. It's what drew him to Gethsemane. This is an understanding of holiness primarily defined by ascetical self-denial. And in this place comes an understanding of holiness based on compassionate, solidarity with his fellow human beings. And Merton came to see that the entire purpose of the monastic life, or any spiritual search for that matter, was to achieve this vision, this awakening from a dream of separateness, to realize our underlying oneness, our unity in what he called a hidden wholeness. No doubt, this marked a critical turning point in his evolution as a monk. For years, Merton had devoted creative thought to the meaning of monastic and contemplative life, but from this point on he became increasingly concerned with making connections between the monastery and the wider world. His writing assumed a more ecumenical and compassionate tone. Reading his old writing, he observes, I cannot go back to the earlier fervor or the asceticism that accompanied it. The new fervor will be rooted not in asceticism, but in humanism. For Merton, it was a kind of rebirth. I'm finally coming out of the chrysalis, he writes. Now, the pain and struggle of fighting my way out into something new and much bigger, I must see and embrace God in the whole world. Along with his writings on prayer and spirituality, he began to write prophetic essays on the issues of the day, particularly the Cold War atmosphere of fear, the threat of nuclear war. Not everyone, to be sure, was happy with this new Thomas Merton. They preferred, quote, the official voice of Trappist silence, the monk with his hood up and his back to the camera, brooding over the waters of an artificial lake. The new Merton, he wrote, 
quote, was not the petulant and uncanonizable modern Jerome who never go, got over the fact that he could give up beer. To this, he added words intended to shock his pious devotees. I drink beer whenever I can lay my hands on it. I love beer, and by that very act, the world. And yet he believed his love for the world implied a prophetic stance, a need to criticize its spiritual delusions. In collaboration with like-minded social critics and spiritual seekers, quote, to make the world better, more free, more just, more livable, more human. While some of Merton's readers wished he would stick with the old writing on the liturgy and prayer, there were also many new readers who wondered what he was doing holed up in a monastery. Wasn't this life of prayer and solitude a cop-out from the more relevant action in the streets? For Merton, this never posed a serious temptation. In fact, his increasing engagement with the world outside the monastery was accompanied by a deeper call to solitude. Monks in the Benedictine tradition, including Trappists like Merton, take a vow of what is called stability. In a literal sense, this is a vow to remain in the monastery in which they're attached. It's a commitment not to run away when things get tough or to imagine that life will be easier if you just didn't have to put up with all the idiots around you. What disturbs you is inside you, and if you leave, you'll just take it with you somewhere else. But there's a deeper principle involved than just staying put. Contemplating the, complementing the vow of stability is a second Benedictine principle called conversatio morum, literally the conversion of manners. Essentially, it refers to the ongoing process of growth and spiritual maturity, going deeper into the heart of your vocation. The task of becoming a monk doesn't end when you take your vows. It is an ongoing journey that lasts a lifetime. There's no doubt that for Thomas Merton, the vow of stability was a particular challenge. In his early book based on his journals, The Sign of Jonas, he described stability as the belly of the whale, the mysterious paradox through which, like the prophet Jonah, he was being carried to his ultimate destination. Though his early monastic writings describe a feeling of giddy homecoming, his later journals tell a different story. Irritation with the banal business operations of the monastery, conflicts with his abbot, frustrations with a religious system that seemed determined to stifle his yearnings for a life of solitary prayer. In his early years, he was beset by the notion of joining a, quote, purer order like the Carthusians or Carmaldales. This later gave way to fantasies of fleeing to a hermitage or a community in Mexico, Nicaragua, Chile, the Virgin Islands, New Mexico, or Alaska, seemingly anywhere but Gethsemane. Inevitably, these plans were quashed by his superiors if they had not already been replaced by newer schemes. In light of such frustrations, he could write, I think the monastic life as we live it here warps people, kills their spirit, reduces them to something less than human. He proclaims to his journal, It's intolerable to have to spend my life contributing to the maintenance of this illusion, the illusion of the great, gay, joyous, peppy, optimistic, Jesus-loving, 100% American Trappist monastery. Note that at the time he was the novice master in this monastery. Eventually, Merton realized that he didn't have to leave Gethsemane. What he really wanted was greater interior space to define the meaning of his contemplative vocation. It was not a call to leave the monastery, but to rediscover its inner meaning. He wrote, It doesn't much matter where you are, as long as you can be at peace about it and live your life. The place certainly will not live my life for me. I have to live it for myself. And where would he find the solitude he sought? Here or there makes no difference. Somewhere, nowhere, beyond all where. Solitude outside geography or in it. No matter. At this point, after years of clamoring for a more solitary life, Merton was given permission to live in a simple hermitage on the monastery grounds, a situation that proved conducive to both prayer and creative work. Happily, he wrote, The sense of a journey ended, of wandering at an end, the first time in my life I ever really felt that I had come home and that my roaming and looking were ended. It's not the first time he'd said that. It wouldn't be the last. The pure silence and solitude of his hermitage, Merton felt he was making his own kind of protest against a world in which communication had been replaced by party platforms and advertising slogans, in which time and existence itself were 
measured out and weighed for their productive value. As a spiritual explorer, he felt a special connection with the desert fathers of the fourth century who had left the comforts and compromises of a supposedly Christian world for the solitude of the wilderness. In words that really applied to himself, he wrote, What the Desert Fathers sought most of all was their own true self in Christ, and in order to do this, they had to reject completely the false, formal self, fabricated under social compulsion in the world. They sought a way to God that was uncharted and freely chosen, not inherited from others who had mapped it out beforehand. We need to learn from these men of the fourth century how to ignore prejudice, defy compulsion, and strike out fearlessly into the unknown. Merton himself, of course, was seeking a way to God that was uncharted and freely chosen, not inherited from others who had mapped it out beforehand. Unfortunately, there are risks to be faced by those who travel without maps. The solitary desert explorers whom Merton admired faced many such perils in the form of temptations, and the same was true for Merton. It was soon after settling into the hermitage that he faced his own final and most difficult temptation. I refer to his falling in love and conducting a secret affair with a nurse he met in the hospital in Louisville. This episode, which lasted over a period of several months, is described in great detail in volume six of his published journals. It's a story too complex to summarize adequately, but suffice to say that in this affair, Merton experienced a liberating sense of his capacity to love and receive love. His journal is by turns deeply moving, heartbreaking, and also exasperating. Some have romanticized the episode, feeling that he should have, as one of his poet friends put it, follow the ecstasy right out of the monastery. That was a serious option. But what was not an option was to have it both ways, to suppose that there was some way to be both a hermit and a lover. What was at stake was not simply the violation of his monastic vows, but a kind of doubleness, and lack of integrity. He wrote, What do I fear most? Forgetting and ignorance of the inmost truth of my being, to forget who I am, to be lost in what I am not, to fail my own inner truth, to get carried away in what is not true to me. When he was honest with himself, he realized that he was ultimately wedded to his vocation to solitude. Regarding his vows, he wrote, I cannot be true to myself if I am not true to so deep a commitment. He came to the conclusion that his vocation was not just for himself, but that it meant something to the rest of the world. Vocation, he wrote, is more than just a matter of being in a certain place and wearing a certain kind of costume. There are too many people in the world who rely on the fact that I am serious about deepening an inner dimension of experience that they desire that is closed to them, and it's not closed to me. This is a gift that has been given to me, not for myself, but for everyone. I cannot let it be squandered and dissipated foolishly. It would be criminal to do so. In effect, he returned to the idea that had first attracted him to the abbey, that the monastery was in some sense the axis mundi, that the monks were in some way with their prayers and their faithfulness keeping the world turning. But now he was understanding faithfulness not just in terms of an outward form or a particular setting in the monastery, but in terms of the deepest core of himself. The difference suggested that there was not some special vocation for Trappist monks. Wherever people did this, wherever they were faithful to their true selves, they were the axis mundi, the axle of the world, standing up for peace against lies in the integrity of their witness and creating something beautiful and true in their loving service of their neighbors. For the sum, this might be in a soup kitchen, a studio, a marriage, a prison cell. For him, it was in his hermitage. On September 10, 1966, he signed a short formula in which he committed himself, quote, to live in solitude for the rest of my life. He continued to be carried toward his true destiny in the belly of a paradox, traveling without maps, stumbling in the dark, but trusting that he was being guided toward his true home. In 1968, the last year of his life, a more flexible abbot permitted him at last to venture forth, and he accepted an invitation to address an international conference of Christian monks in Bangkok. Merton was particularly excited about the prospect of exploring his deep interest in Eastern spirituality. 
In this respect, as his journals show, the trip marked a new breakthrough, another encounter with the gate of heaven that is everywhere. He met with Buddhist and Hindu monks. In India, he had several significant meetings with the Dalai Lama. In Ceylon, one week before his death, in the presence of enormous statues of the reclining Buddha, he was, quote, suddenly, almost forcibly, jerked clean out of the habitual, half-tied vision of things, and an inner clearness, clarity, as if exploding from the rocks themselves, became evident and obvious. Everything is emptiness, and everything is compassion. It was the culmination of his Asian pilgrimage. Quote, I mean, I know and have seen what I was obscurely looking for. And perhaps it was something more. On December 10th, he delivered his talk in Bangkok, and afterward he retired to his room for a shower and a nap. In this talk, in the last hour of his life, he spoke of the monastic principle of conversatium morum, what he called the most mysterious and yet most essential of all monastic vows. He interpreted it as, quote, a commitment to total inner transformation of one sort or another, a commitment to become a completely new man. It seems to me that that could be regarded as the end of the monastic life, and no matter where one attempts to do this, that remains the essential thing. A short while after delivering this talk, he was found dead in his room, apparently, though mysteriously, electrocuted by the faulty wiring of a fan. In Merton's writings, there are many foreshadowings of this end. In his early journal, The Sign of Jonas, he concludes with a tour of the monastery during a nighttime fire watch, ending in the belfry, where he imagines his hand on the door, quote, through which I see the heavens. The door swings out upon a vast sea of darkness and of prayer. Will it come like this, the moment of my death? Will you open a door upon the great forest and set my feet upon a ladder under the moon and take me out among the stars? Likewise, he had concluded the seven-story mountain with a mysterious speech in the voice of God in which he contemplated his end. Do not ask, when it will be, or where it will be, or how it will be, on a mountain, or in a prison, or in a desert, or in a concentration camp, or in a hospital, or at Gethsemane. It doesn't matter. So don't ask me, because I'm not going to tell you. You will not know until you are in it. But you shall taste the true solitude of my anguish and my poverty, and I shall lead you into the high places of my joy, and you shall die in me and find all things in my mercy, which has created you for this end. During his life, Merton published nearly 50 books, ranging from histories of monasticism, books on prayer and the spiritual life, several volumes of poetry, collections of essays on topics including Zen Buddhism and Eastern religion, Gandhi's philosophy of nonviolence, Native American spirituality, the novels of Camus and Faulkner, and prophetic responses still remarkably topical to the problems of war, racism, and the desecration of nature. Posthumously, these books have been joined by nearly as many published works, including five volumes of his correspondence, collections of photographs, and seven volumes of journals. Apart from his brilliance as a writer, what accounts for the enduring interest in Merton? He was a poet and artist, a born rebel who spent most of his life under a vow of obedience, a man thoroughly formed by the tempestuous currents of the 20th century who found peace and meaning in an austere brand of monasticism rooted in the 12th century. A Catholic priest who entered into creative dialogue with people of all faiths, especially the religions of the East. A man whose solitude became a watchtower, allowing him to discern with uncommon insight the pathologies of our time, the self-destructive materialism that leaves us spiritually impoverished, the mythology that divides humanity into opposing blocks that threaten global destruction. He was a man of the widest vision who wished to reach beyond the confines of his solitary life to enter into dialogue with writers, artists, activists, and visionaries of all traditions. He was all these things, but for many who have been fascinated and inspired by his work, Merton is the consummate spiritual explorer, one who never ceased in the quest to know God and to know himself to grow in the direction of a truth beyond words and images, and to report back on what he discovered. For spiritual explorers like Merton, their message is ultimately rooted in their own inner journey, 
and for many spiritual seekers in the past 50 years, an encounter with Thomas Merton has been a significant milestone on their own journey. In that sense, perhaps, Merton represents a type of holiness particularly suited and necessary to our times. He let go of his possessions, his ego, his certainty, and even a spurious kind of supposed holiness until he came to rest in God's compassion and emptiness. Pope Francis has said that God has encountered walking along the path, and as Merton showed, sometimes we walk that path without maps. Merton, the spiritual explorer, created his path by walking it. But in his own struggle to be faithful, he created possibilities for many others to live with greater compassion, courage, and integrity. And through his writings, he cast seeds of contemplation and communion that continue to bear fruit in diverse and unexpected places. For those of us who struggle to see the road ahead of us, he is a welcome guide and companion. Thank you very much for joining me today. I really enjoyed this. In the next session, I'm going to be talking about somebody I knew very well, Henry Nouwen. He was a friend for 20 years. For 10 years, I was one of his editors. Uh, And his life, like uh, Merton, exemplifies what it means to be a spiritual explorer and whose lessons, I think, come very much from that story of his spiritual exploration that continued until the end of his life, not just from the books that we're familiar with and his writings. So I hope you'll come back. And in the meantime, God bless.